Thank you so much, John, and uh, I'd like to thank you and uh, the uh, organizing committee for an invitation to this uh, really a great conference, which is a great refresher on, newer, on new developments in hematological malignancies. So I'm taking the stand on novel agents and chemotherapy in salvage of those patients with early relapse, and my job is now much easier after Peter showed you already uh, exciting developments in targeted therapy of, of relapsed refractory follicular lymphoma. Those are just my disclosures. So what we are really talking about here, what we are debating, as you can see, uh, if you treat patients with chemotherapy, at two years after the treatment, about a third of your patients will relapse, and about two-thirds will not. And what, be what become clear over the last several years is that the patients who do not relapse do very well. Uh, their life expectancy is uh, normal, actually. Uh, so there is a, a large group of patients here shown in gold, 70% of the patients who do very well. Now, what we worry about are the patients who do relapse within the first two years after chemoimmunotherapy, and this is the group shown here in blue. And if you look at that overall survival of those patients, it is poor, and there's an early drop-off in survival, and the median survival for those patients is about three years, which is obviously uh, uh, suboptimal in follicular lymphoma. So those are the patients in the need of novel therapies, and those are the patients in which you would possibly consider transplant. I don't think the transplant will have a major role in the other group of patients who are doing quite well. Now, why not transplant in a relapse? Well, I hope to convince you in the next couple of minutes the transplant never really worked well even before the era of novel therapies. And certainly in the era of novel therapies, the, the uh, role of the transplant has rapidly diminished. Those novel agents are quite active in the relapse refractory uh, diffuser B-cell lymphoma, including in those patients with early relapse after chemoimmunotherapy. I'll also show you that we have now very exciting clinical trials, which are uh, built for those patients. You can consider those trials rather than uh, transplant approaches. And at the end, I'll show you that almost nobody does the transplant in the relapse refractory lymphoma anyway. So, you know, uh, it's people are voting with their feet, if you would. So, rather than showing you some older studies, uh, which are the out of co-founders there, including that a lot of patients were not treated in Rituxan era, I focus a lot of the discussion on this most recent analysis, which is also uh, coming from the lymphocare uh, study. So this is the same study which showed that patients who relapsed early have poor outcome. And what this analysis had done, it was it looked at patients with follicular lymphoma and early relapse who underwent hematopoietic stem cell transplantation or did not go for stem cell transplant for various reasons. You can see the patient flow there. There are over 2,500 uh, patients in a, a lymphocare study. And from a, a bone marrow registry, there are over 300 uh, patients who actually received the transplant. In lymphocare study, patients who died early uh, were excluded because they were not able to get the transplant. Uh, patients who, in both analysis, patients who are over 70 were excluded because they were considered too old to, to get the transplant. So it is a, quite a selected patient population, as you would imagine. At the end of the day, there were 123 patients who actually received transplant, and they received transplant early within one year after relapse. And you can see that there appeared to be a slight advantage for hematopoietic stem cell transplant in this group. If you look at all the patients with already relapsed, however, there was no survival advantage to hematopoietic stem cell transplant, autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation in this group. And as you can imagine, such an analysis is actually associated with significant biases. So number one, this is an uncontrolled study. There is a bias in selection of patients if to undergo autologous stem cell transplantation including selection of patients with chemosensitive disease, so patients who are actually responding well enough to go for the transplant. Uh, they very typically have better performance status and less comorbidities. More importantly, the lymphocare study actually excluded patients dying early within the first four months after relapse. So you're already really selecting much better population here. And there is really no uh, information in this analysis on, on the impact of subsequent uh, therapy following relapse. 
Now, this study did include patients with follicular grade 3 lymphoma. And as you know, we have grade 3A and grade 3B, and most of us would consider grade 3B to be an aggressive lymphoma, for which, in the last refractory setting, we would consider transplant to be appropriate. Unfortunately, uh, in those retrospective studies, we have no way to differentiate between grade 3A and 3B. And, and about 30% of the patients altogether had uh, follicular lymphoma grade 3 in this study. So there is a potential impact of skewing the results. Finally, patients in those analysis are actually enrolled prior to development of those targeted agents so, and, and broad use of bendamustin. So the results may not be necessarily applicable to the population which we see now. Um, and indeed, if you look at the survival curves in, those, in this analysis, you can see this selection bias quite easily. Because the blue curve on the, on the right side, it shows you what the survival of those patients after relapse look like in initial analysis. And on the, on the opposite side, you see survival of those patients. And even in the patients who did not go for the stem cell transplantation, the survival was much better than seen in original analysis. Again, supporting the observation that there's a huge selection bias in the study, uh, despite seemingly uh, positive impact on survival of hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. So, autologous transplant, really no clear-cut evidence, at least in my book, that's actually improving the outcome here. Well, what about allogeneic transplant? If autologous doesn't do it, maybe allogeneic transplant is able to improve the uh, outcome of those patients. And this is from the uh, uh, paper which is now in press by uh, Sonny Smith and colleagues uh, from um, uh, Bone Marrow Transplant Registry. Uh, you can see they look at the large number of patients undergoing transplantation for relapse and refractory uh, follicular lymphoma with early treatment failure. So this is exactly the population we are talking about. So patients relapsing within the uh, first 24 months after chemoimmunotherapy. About 240 patients at our other transplant, 105 um, much sibling and much unrelated donor, 95 uh, patients. You can see that uh, uh, Grad versus host disease was quite common. A uh, grade two to four was seen in 35% uh, of patients all, overall. And what you can see here that if you do much unrelated donor, the upfront price in the panel A here is quite high. There is a high likelihood uh, that people, there's a high uh, non-tumor-related uh, uh, mortality, uh, transplant-related mortality. You can decrease it with um, much sibling donor, however, it's still quite high. The autologous transplant has relatively a low mortality. Now, if you look at panel B, the autologous transplant, however, was not as successful as uh, allogeneic uh, transplants, which were associated with the higher mortality. So at the end of the day, if you look at the progression-free survival curves and overall survival curves, there is no clear-cut benefit to allogeneic stem cell transplantation from this analysis. So I just showed you that we don't have a good evidence of autologous stem cell transplant helps. And I'm telling and I'm showing you that allogeneic is no better to autologous stem cell transplant. So the role for, uh, for those is quite limited. So, and that's really affecting all the transplant uh, data. I'm sure my opponent here will be presenting to you a number of survival curves. But if you look at this, there is a significant selection bias in all those studies. And the, the, the Smith paper is actually very illustrative of this because it shows, uh, the authors say that the median time from diagnosis to hematopoietic stem cell transplantation was 24 months. Um, uh, for autologous, 23 uh, for sibling and 27 for a much unrelated transplant. So let's just do a mental exercise and imagine how the survival curves lo lo would look like in patients who are relapsing 24 months after communotherapy. So somewhere there, and now this is imaginary analysis, so I kind of just paste it and shifted this curve, and you can see that the survival doesn't necessarily look much different than what we see after transplant. Again likely as a result of the uh, selection bias. Now, to do it in a correct way, of course, you need to do a lot of imputations and, uh, and actual simulation, but this is just a fun mental exercise. So what we can do? Well, there's emerging evidence 
the targeted therapies, and some of those therapies, uh, Peter already mentioned, have activity in patients with either lapse of, uh, of follicular lymphoma after chemotherapy within the spread 12, uh, first 12 or 24 months. Uh, there was a recent report in blood shows, for example, that uh, idalalisib in those patients with either lapse has similar response rate uh, and similar progression-free survival to patients relapsing later on. So it appears that targeted therapy can actually overcome the uh, poor uh, phenotype of those patients. Uh, the same uh, is true about R-square. There's an early signal of uh, activity of R-square in those patients. Uh, this comes from the Magnify study, which uses a combination of lenalidomide and rituximab for a year, and then patients are randomized to rituximab maintenance versus uh, R2 maintenance, um, additional maintenance after the induction, but everybody gets induction. And at least early look shows that there is a significant activity of R-square in patients who have early relapse after chemoimmunotherapy. So those are just two examples. There's no reason to think that, for example, copanlisib or other pa 3 kinase inhibitors would not, would not work similarly to idalalisib. And I'm sure those analysis of uh, outcomes in patients with early follicular lymphoma relapse are currently ongoing, and we'll see more and more data emerging that targeted therapies are really the ones which can change the uh, outcome here. Peter already alluded to this uh, intergroup study, uh, S1608, uh, in follicular lymphoma patients with early relapse, uh, which actually randomizes patients to lenalidomide plus obeduzumab, novel PI3 kinase uh, inhibitor, uh, TGR1202, plus obeduzumab or CHOP plus obeduzumab. You are still allowed to have a consolidative transplant in this trial if, if your heart is really stuck on a transplant, but this is really the way of the future. We're now trying to use those new drugs, targeted agents, uh, which can overcome the resistance to, to chemotherapy uh, for those patients. And there are many more industry-sponsored studies in relapse refractory uh, follicular lymphoma, specifically also targeting this population in development. So you really should focus on referring the patients for the trial. Finally, this analysis coming now a number of years ago from Brian Link from LymphoCare study again, over 2,700 patients with follicular uh, lymphoma. And he looked at the therapy choice for relapse and refractory follicular lymphoma. And if you look really, really carefully, do you see this brown, very, very small number there you cannot read? 1.7%. 1.7% of patients with relapse refractory follicular lymphoma go for transplant, either autologous stem cell transplant or allogeneic stem cell transplant. So people voted with their feet about this therapy. Now, so in conclusion, I think we have exciting novel agents, right? Toxinamab, lenalidomide, uh, pi 3 kinase inhibitors, idalalisib was shown already to be effective in this. I'm sure copalinisib and others will have similar activity. Uh, we have new antibodies, uh, which Peter already alluded to. I didn't even mention uh, all the treatments like radioimmunotherapy. You can always use radiation therapy for localized relapse. And really, we have very exciting clinical trials specifically targeting those patients, ranging from novel monoclonal antibodies through targeted agents all the way to CAR T cells. So the field is really evolving really rapidly. Um, so you can choose any of those, but don't do more of the same. You know? Uh, either with giving just higher dose of chemotherapy with autologous stem cell transplant or giving high dose chemotherapy with a twist, a lot twist, if you would, and sending people for transplant. Because as our, one of our great scientists said, it's never really a good idea to repeat the same treatment over and over again and expect different results. And that's my case. Thank you.